go to Romans chapter 8, read verses 1 through 4. Give me some amens when you get there. We've got a lot to cover. Y'all ain't there that fast. Don't act like y'all got there that fast. You lying. That's how you know the Holy Spirit's working. You open your Bible and you're on Romans chapter 8. A lot to cover today. It's going to be an hour-long sermon. I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do that. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Jesus Christ. And because, uh, and because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in the body, God declared an end to sins controlled over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us, who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I praise you for the victories of this church. I praise you for the joy of this church. Uh, Father, I want to thank you for the people that you've put around this church that has grown it not just here in this local area of Texarkana, but Father, throughout the world. Um, it's been amazing to watch. I love watching you work, and we thank you and we give you all the praise for that. Father, it's been your direction the entire time. And uh, Father, I just ask that you continue to grow us in your timing, in your way. Most importantly, Father, that we grow spiritually. We are not concerned about numbers or money in this church. Father, our biggest concern is that people walk out of here feeling the Holy Spirit when they leave, feeling your love when they leave. And uh, Father, again, I just ask that you continue to guide and direct the leadership of this church to make sure that happens. We'll be obedient to that, and we'll push past it. Father, today you've given me a sermon. This sermon is, um, I didn't have a lot of confidence in it yesterday. Uh, I praise you for waking me up this morning and building my confidence. Uh, Thank you for adding some things to this that give us um, some more direction. Uh, but Father, in order to give your word, I'm asking for your anointment at this time. I ask that you anoint me from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. Father, that you take any doubt that I may have, any struggles that I may have, anything that is blocking me from delivering your word, Father, I ask that you cast it into the sea, just like that worship team, just like our worship team sang that song. Father, I cast all that away. And I ask that you replace all of that, Father, with you, your breath, your knowledge, your wisdom, your guidance, and most importantly, Father, your love. I ask these things in your name. Help us to love, laugh, and forgive. Amen. All right. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, uh, we're going to be in Romans. We're going to stay in Romans chapter 8 for just a second, and then we're going to go to the book of John for pretty much the rest of the sermon. So I'm going to give you a second to put a mark in John, so you can jump over there here in a little bit. Sure, Sarah. I'm not going to tell you exactly where. I'm going to make you dig a little bit. <laughs> over the last few weeks, God has had us discuss some tough topics here at Christian Warriors Church. In the last three weeks, we have discussed divorce, abuse, and then suicide. Because of these tough topics, we have had a lot of people reach out to us, not only here locally, but through social media. These people have expressed many different feelings from these sermons. Some were relieved, some confused, some were angry, some were happy, and some were sad. That's okay. These types of responses are natural when you discuss tough topics, okay? Nothing wrong with those types of responses. However, we also received some responses from people who are living in guilt and shame. These people are struggling to move forward in life because of their past mistakes. And we need to understand that response is not okay. A lot of people that I got some messages from, you know, received a lot, you know, I used to be abusive, 
and uh, I need to know how to get back in God's favor. Micah, I got a divorce that did not line up with what y'all preached on. It was not biblically done correctly. I exited God's covenant of marriage illegally. And I feel like God doesn't hear me anymore. I feel like God doesn't care anymore because of my past mistakes. Micah, I had thoughts of suicide. And I feel that I even had somebody say they tried to commit suicide. By the grace of God, they weren't able to do it. But they're still down. They're hurting. They don't feel that God is with them because of past mistakes. The feeling that these people are having can be explained by one word, and it is the title of today's sermon. Condemnation. Some people don't even know what condemnation is. Let's look at the definition of condemnation. The expression of very strong disapproval. There are feelings that come with this. I want to look at uh, some feelings that are associated with this word condemnation. Guilt, shame, regret, and unworthiness. Show of hands in this room. Who in this room has ever felt any of these feelings you didn't raise your hand you're too young you ain't got there yet (laughs) I need you to understand it's normal for our flesh to feel condemnation I mean it's been around since the very beginning I mean Adam and Eve I mean right I mean Adam and Eve had it they had it made everything was perfect God told them not to do, told them, don't do one thing. Don't eat off the tree. Don't do that. They ate off the tree. The next thing you know, guess what? God comes down. He says, Adam, where are you? And he's hiding. Him and Eve felt that condemnation because of their past mistake. From that moment on, condemnation has been put into this world. So again, I need you to understand it is normal. It's normal for our flesh to feel that way. The good news is we no longer have to live in condemnation. The Bible shows us when we go from the Old Testament and then jump to the New Testament, a man named Jesus showed up. He took all of that condemnation to the cross with him. Amen? I want to go back and look at Romans 8, 1 again. Guys, I, I want you all to do me a favor. If you've got your Bibles open, I want you to underline... I want you to highlight, and I want you to circle two words. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Circle, underline, highlight those two words, guys. This verse is telling us that if you are a child of God, if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you belong in Christ Jesus, catch this, condemnation has no vacancy in your life no vacancy when I was a kid I remember <laughs> it was July 4th weekend I was just a little kid and uh, we went to Disney World and on the way back my dad decided he wanted to go through New Orleans Hannah will probably remember this so we go into New Orleans not thinking it's July 4th week okay I think it was actually the weekend and uh, we're there and we're hanging out all day long but then it hits us like we ain't got a hotel and we need to stay here in New Orleans We went from hotel to hotel to hotel, and every sign, some of y'all remember this, some of you young people have no idea what I'm talking about, but back in the day, y'all remember there was a sign in the window that said, no vacancy, it would be lit up, and if it wasn't lit up, that means they had some vacancy. Guys, we went from hotel to hotel, no vacancy, no vacancy, no vacancy. We finally found one, by the way, in downtown New Orleans. It's the nastiest thing I ever stayed at in my life. I remember, I'll never forget, we were looking, (laughs) it was like, we, we were a family of five, And if I remember correctly, it was two small beds in there. Well, because of that, you know, I had two older sisters. The the, the boy, the son, usually one always sleeping on the floor, right? I mean, that's just how that works. So we were trying to find, like, some extra blankets and pillows, and they wouldn't bring it to us. And I remember opening up the the, the closet that was there, and at the top, we thought that that's what it was. And we get to looking, and it was something rolled up in a sheet. I slept on the floor with nothing. Okay, like I definitely were going to get that sheet, but that's the kind of hotel that we were staying in. But guys, what I'm getting at is, is Satan does the same thing, guys. He goes from 
house to house to house. You need to make sure that your no vacancy sign is lit up because if you let him in, condemnation will follow. You understand? Keep that no vacancy sign on at all times. In John chapter 8, we see the story of the prostitute that was brought to Jesus by the religious leaders. Um, you know, that story, most of us know it. I'll just go through it briefly. But the leaders are there. They bring this prostitute to Jesus. They want her stoned to death. Jesus, again, draws in the dirt for a little while. He's waiting on God to give him the right words. He stands up and he says, Ye that has not sinned, cast the first stone. And the next thing you know, right, they're all leaving, right? We all know the story. This is the part I need you to catch, is that Jesus is standing there, and it's just him and the prostitute, and that's all that's left. And Jesus looks at her, and he says, where are all your condemners? And let's see what he says in John 8, 11. She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Jesus wasn't letting her off the hook, by the way. I need y'all to catch this. He wasn't letting her off the hook for her sins, but he was showing her that she no longer had to live with that sin. We need to understand there's always consequences for sins. I think we can all agree with that, but in Jesus Christ, we can turn on that no vacancy sign and not allow that sin again to move in our lives permanently. I want to go look at John 3, 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible, and I'm going to tell you why. This verse, I'm going to tell you what this verse tells me. This verse tells me that Jesus Christ is in the construction business. How many times, especially here in Texarkana, you walk downtown and you find these old buildings, and they got a sign on it that says condemned. And if you keep reading on those signs, it'll say it's unfit, it's unsafe, you don't need to be around this, you know, so forth and so on. That's, that's what you get out of it. Well, when we feel condemned, and that sign's on our door, if we just allow the great construction worker in the door, he will not only rebuild it, he'll remodel it. And that's something that we have to accept. That's the thing, guys. We feel condemned. We feel so beat up. We feel unworthy that we don't even want to open the door to allow him to come in and fix it. And here's the cool thing about it. He does it for free. Construction's expensive. You know what I'm saying? Y'all seen the price of wood? I know that some of you right now, y'all are probably thinking, but Micah, if Jesus doesn't condemn us, then why at times do I still feel guilt, shame, regret, and unworthiness? Because like I said, guys, earlier, it is natural for our flesh, notice I said flesh, to feel that way. The good news is we don't have to live by the flesh. Because of Jesus Christ, we can now live by the Spirit. And the Spirit does not condemn. Jesus does not condemn he does something completely different. I want to go to John 15, excuse me, John 16, 7 through 8. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is your advantage that I go away. This is Jesus speaking. It's in red. For if I do not go away, the helper, which is the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Keep in mind, he's speaking to the disciples here. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Christian warriors need to understand there's a major difference between condemnation and conviction. Major, major difference. I want to look at the definition of conviction. An awareness of sin, I don't know why that's underlined, that results in repentance, confession, and cleansing. That sounds a whole lot better than condemnation, right? So do we see there's a difference here? Christian head nods. I need to know y'all are getting something out of this, okay? Excellent. Now let's look at the feelings that come with conviction. 
grace, confession, repentance, and forgiveness. Sounds a whole lot better, right? There's a major difference here, guys. Conviction is a great thing. Some of you are like, what you talking about, man? It hurts. Yeah, it hurts. But I'm telling you right now, we want to feel conviction. When we feel conviction, that means Jesus Christ lives in our heart. You know, I have a lot of people that will ask me. I remember not too long ago, I, I had somebody that I, I did a funeral for. And I only met this individual a couple times. Um, and the family reached out to ask if I would do this funeral. And um, you know, they asked me. They said, Micah, you know, I'm just not sure that this person was saved. Well, I had had a conversation with that individual years before. I knew they were saved, but one of the biggest ways that I knew they were saved was the conviction that came from them. I need you to understand that a child of God will feel that conviction. In fact, I'll be honest with you, I really struggle with people when they do something wrong and there is no conviction. I'm very concerned about their salvation. I'm very concerned because if Jesus Christ is in their heart, you'll see major conviction. No conviction scares me. With this individual that I did the funeral for, I saw a lot of conviction out of this person. He was a good person. You can't have that unless Jesus Christ is here. Do you understand? Another great thing about conviction, guys, is it means that you're, rec you're recognizing and admitting your sin. Um, again, I, I, just, I struggle with people that can't recognize it. Let me ask you all this. I mean... Show of hands, how many people know somebody like that? Man, they do something wrong, and, and I was just kidding, but you raised your hand real quick. So. <laughs> but y'all know what I'm saying. I mean, you got people that just, they do it wrong. They blame it on everybody else. You know, it's never their fault. There's no conviction there. Guys, here's what I'm going to say about that. Cause people like that, you get very upset with. You don't want anything to do with. Now, there's ways that we handle this as a Christian, and here's how that is. Romans chapter 14 tells us this. You lead by example, and you pray for them. When y'all know somebody that you know is struggling with conviction, this is what it does for me is immediately, again, like I was saying earlier, a red flag comes up that I'm very concerned about their salvation. So I'm immediately praying for them constantly. Constantly, and I, I tell you something that you can grasp on to. One of the things that God's shown me, because you know, you always hear people say, "Well, you got to pray for somebody. You can pray for them all the time. Pray for them all the time." Th that's hard to do, right? Like you pray for them, and you pray for them for a few days, kind of forget, and, and or you got other struggles that come around, so you, you really focused on that. You know what I'm saying? Or somebody else comes around that has no conviction, then you worry about praying for them. Guys, here's what I've learned to do. God has shown me this in my walk. What's the number of completion in the Bible, Christian warriors? Seven. Seven. Mark it on your calendar. Pray for them for seven straight days and then move on. That's completion. You're, you're, you're following guidelines of what God's put in that Bible. Everything that he's done that marks a completion is seven. So I promise you, you're honoring him by doing that. Mark it on your calendar. Pray every day for a week and pray for that individual. For seven straight days. And he may come back to you and you may have to do it again. Especially some of these people that you deal with. You've got to do it again. Mikey, I've prayed for you many times, seven times. You know what I'm saying? Seven times seven times seven. <laughs> the Holy Spirit tries to convict us of our wrongs so we can gain wisdom and knowledge by learning from our past mistakes. But Satan does not, excuse me, but Satan takes these same mistakes and sends you into depression. See, the Holy Spirit... A lot of Christians, this is where they get it wrong, guys. They turn conviction, excuse me, they turn condemnation into something so much worse than what it is. And what they do is they take that condemnation and it turns into depression. Where if you're convicted, you're turning it into wisdom and knowledge so you don't do it again. Y'all follow me there? I kind of stumbled on that. I'm sorry. Let me get back to my place. I want you to think about it when, con when, when, when you feel condemned, when Satan condemns you about your mistakes, you dwell in those mistakes, and again, depression follows. Condemnation, no, depression. Depression is born through condemnation. There you go. And that's the way you need to look at it. 
Guys, there's many times, and I, you know, Satan will always remind you about your past. He'll bring these things up. I think we're all guilty of this. Satan brings it towards you. It could be something you did years ago. And all of a sudden, it brings you down. In that moment, you have a decision to make, Christian warriors. You can either dwell in that and fall into depression. Or you can remind Satan of his future when he reminds you of your past. And you can stand firm and put him back below your feet where he belongs and you move on. Condemnation will come. Whether you hang on to it or not is your choice. We don't have to do that. We don't have to live with that sin for the rest of our lives. If you're a child of God, I need you to understand the minute you did it, God forgave you and he also forgot it. He forgot it. It's time for you to forget it as well. The minute you feel condemnation, you need to understand that's Satan, that's not God. God will never remind you of your past mistakes to bring you down. He may remind you of your past mistakes, but it will be in a moment where you will gain wisdom and knowledge. It will be in a moment when it encourages you it encourages you not to make the same mistake again. You understand what I'm saying? Like when, when let's say you made a huge mistake and, and then something similar like that crosses your path, God may remind you of, do you remember how you felt? You remember how that was? That's conviction. That's your encouragement to get past it. That's what that is. It, it, it shows you that God forgets, guys. We remember and Satan reminds. That's how that works. God forgets. We remember, Satan reminds. Don't dwell in condemnation. Don't hang on to something that Jesus Christ has already paid for, guys. The next time that that memory comes across your mind and it grabs a hold of you, you need to envision this. Jesus already died for that, so don't hang on to it. So you need to envision him on the cross. He's up there on the cross suffering. And it's just like, guys, if y'all hang on to that condemnation, if you hang on to that sin from your past, I mean, you might as well put him back up on the cross. I mean, I don't know about y'all, but I don't ever want to see any man go through that, especially twice. Leave it at the cross. Leave those past mistakes there. Again, learn from them. But don't let them dwell on you. Don't let it take you into depression. Once you've reached salvation, guys, you are no longer condemned. As a child of God, there is a difference in what you did and who you are now. Condemnation is spiritual warfare at its finest. I need you to pay attention to this. This is something that I've learned on my walk um, in the last 10 years of my life. I want to explain to you guys the simple difference between condemnation and conviction. Are y'all paying attention? Condemnation is a distraction. Conviction is motivation. If you don't get anything else from this sermon, I need you to grab this. If you feel condemned and you fall into depression mode, guess what's happening? You're distracted from the things that God is putting in front of you that he needs you to do that day. Because all you can think about is, is this crud over here instead of what he's putting in front of you. It's a lot like golf. We got any golfers in here? Anybody played golf? Anything like that? What's the matter with y'all? Okay. Football. Okay. Quarterback, right? Let's take Dak Prescott, for example. Well, we sure ain't going to bring up Tom Brady. I'll tell you that right now. Okay. Troy Aikman. How's that sound? That a little better, Troy Aikman? Some of these young people are, don't even know who Troy Aikman is. Winner. <laughs> Winner. Amen. <laughs> Three Super Bowls. Yeah. So let's take a quarterback. Let's take Troy Aikman. And he's actually a good one to use. Troy Aikman is one of the most confident quarterbacks that I ever saw growing up watching football. Troy Aikman would throw an interception. Do you think he dwelled in that? He went to the sidelines. He started studying what he did wrong, and he went right back out on the field, and he did the best he could. You don't want a quarterback that's going to throw an interception and then come right back out and all he's thinking about is the interception he throws. He's going to throw another one. 
It's the same thing with us with condemnation. Satan will remind you of your past over and over again, and it distracts you from winning. And then conviction is motivation. I said this just a second ago, but I'm going to expand on this a little bit more. My past mistakes that get brought up to me, it'll bring me down for a minute. I'm not going to lie to y'all, it will. It hurts. It hurts right now. But the thing is, I'm not going to hang on to that. And it's my motivation to never go there again. Because I know how that feels. It hurts my heart. And again, that's how you know he's there. That's him that's hurting. Don't go back to that. Think of how bad that was. How bad that decision was. How much it hurt. Who you hurt. That is your motivation to never go there again. That's conviction. Motivation. Use it that way. That again is spiritual warfare at its finest. You can either hang on to condemnation and sulk and, and, and hide and get distracted. Or again, you can put Satan back below your feet and you can move forward with conviction and be encouraged to continue on and to do better. Big difference here between the two. Y'all give me just a second, please. I had some other things I wanted to preach on, and uh, he just said, no. I'm going to go a different route. We all mess up. We all make a lot of mistakes. And that's where God's grace comes in. You see, Adam and Eve were under the old law. And then it fell into the Mosaic law with Moses. And then Jesus Christ came and died and it became the grace law. Amen? We're under that law now. And this is where it comes in. I want you to think about something, guys. No matter the mistakes you made, you, you go back to God and you cry for help. And this is where a lot of people mess up. They take condemnation and they mess up again and they think, well, I done done it again. I'm not going to go back to him and ask for help. Am I the only Christian here who used to feel that way? I want you all to think about it this way. Let's say my youngest daughter, Caroline, because I, I can see her doing this. Let's say, let's, say, let's say I'm sitting inside, or let's say I'm outside grilling, right? We've got this cool little tree that's like a climbing tree at the house. Let's say she climbs up this tree, and she slips, and she's hanging on by one hand, just dangling. And she's screaming at me, Dad, help, Dad, help. I'm sitting over grilling, I just look at her, I'm like, well, hang on. L let me make sure that you've been acting right today. Let me go talk to Mom, you know, I'll go back inside. Go, How is she acting today? Well, she was kind of messed up. She's out there the whole time dangling from this tree, right? You know, and then I walk back out there, and then I'm like, well, hang on, let me go check with your other sisters and make sure, you, you know, you've been treating them right. And I go back in, and I talk to Sadie and Annabelle, and they probably tell me a lie, but it doesn't matter. And then I come back out, and, and she's still dangling. See, guys, here's what I need you to understand. God don't work that way. I don't either. That's my daughter. I'm her father. If I see my kid dangling from a tree, what's the first thing I'm fixing to do? I'm fixing to sprint to her. And tell her to drop in my arms. Regardless if she falls 30 feet and I break bones. I don't care. That's my child. God's the same way. He's not going to sit there and look at your report card. He's not going to do that. Guys, it doesn't matter how many times you've messed up in your past. It doesn't matter how many times you repeat that same mistake. He will be there with open arms to catch you when you fall. Amen? I know I'm glad. I'm going to close with this, guys. If condemnation is controlling your life, you're allowing Satan to have power over you. I want everybody to, to look in the back of their, uh, or the, the seat in front of you. Everybody grab a sheet of paper and a pen. 
I know some of them may not have paper, so y'all share. Let's be good Christians, okay? Some of them may not have pens. Let's share there. Again, let's be good Christians. Give you a few seconds. Everybody needs to do this. So if you ain't got a sheet of paper, somebody pass it down. I want you to take your sheet of paper. I want you to take your pen. I just want you to draw a dot right in the middle of your paper. Just a dot. Some of y'all are like, man, I'm so glad you didn't have me write an essay or something like that. Just a simple dot. Y'all raise it up. I want to see that y'all did this. Okay. Guys, this dot that you just drew on this paper, again, condemnation has no power over you anymore. Satan has no power over you anymore. He's a defeated foe. Guys, this dot has more power over you than Satan. Y'all feel me? This dot has more power over you than the prince of this earth, the evil one. He has zero power in your life, so why in the world are you hanging on to your past mistakes? Get rid of them. Leave him at the cross. He's already died for him. Amen? Amen. Grab a pen and paper. You got a pen and paper. I'm going to get y'all write this down. <laughs> get y'all write this down. Go ahead, Nick. Condemnation will knock you down, but conviction will turn you around. Amen, right? It even rhymed. I didn't even try to do that. 